So my, myself first, my name's Jim Reed. I'm the VP of Business Development and Marketing at uh, Minitronics. Um, got in the industry in about 1991. Uh, mostly a sales and marketing guy my whole career. A little detour to ops and R&D and process development in the middle. Uh, a series of companies that have been long since rolled up many times into Medtronic, which probably sounds familiar to half you in the audience here. Uh, I was at AMS for a, a while and uh, Baxter most recently before I came to, uh, to Minitronics. Uh, Minitronics, a lot of you probably uh, know us uh, through our traditional business. I'd say most people know us through our original business of doing design, development, and manufacturing uh, of devices for other companies. So, um, uh, other companies. So, uh, electro electromechanical, uh, mostly in the complex uh, end of the spectrum. Um, and uh, we've been doing it forever. We're about 350 people. We're right here in uh, St. Paul. Um, we're, you know, pushing that $100 million figure for, uh, for revenue. Um, still privately held after 21 years. 80% uh, still owned by founders and employees. And um, that's how just about everybody knows us. I think very, very few people know us uh, as a company that also has an internal startup happening. We're doing a device and a therapy, uh, treating a CSF, so spinal fluid. Uh, it's very much a blue water uh, endeavor. No one's really doing very much in that space, or hasn't been. Um, and we've made uh, great progress there. Between those bookends, everyone knowing us and almost nobody knowing us, in the middle, I think some people uh, do think of us correctly as a, as a med tech company. So uh, we've developed a lot of technology and IP uh, over the, the last decade, decade and a half, I would say, um, especially around cardiac assist pumps, implantable pumps, uh, percutaneous VADs, and so on. And we actually enjoy, among other things with customers, enjoy some royalty revenue uh, from those customers, uh, exercising a pretty, a pretty big portfolio of patents. And what they get in return, of course, is you know, good confidence and freedom to operate and a clear path to market working under issued patents that we just licensed to them. So again, I think people tend to think of us as sort of a traditional contract developer manufacturer, but we've gone a long way beyond that in the last, the last decade or so. So we're a little bit uh, a different animal, a little bit non-traditional. I think that's probably why the device talks people thought we might be a good fit for this particular uh, topic. So um, the topic for today really is optimizing resources to build a better med tech team. Um, I think we're going to specifically focus on, on virtual organizations. So how to get the most out of your capital, uh, what to focus on internally to be the best you can possibly be at, uh, what you may not have to focus on that you could uh, do with partners or whatever else, and really driving enterprise value, which is the, the name of the game. Uh, the discussion may be a little bit tilted toward development and manufacturing and stuff we know a lot about. Um, uh, it's also what organizations where people spend a lot of time and energy and money early in their, in their, in their, uh, in their endeavors. Uh, but we also have Dr. Roy Smythe from Philips here with us, uh, who's very much involved in data and devices and big data and informatics, um, which is obviously a pretty critical topic these days for the future, uh, but something that, generally speaking, most device people and most device companies don't have very much experience at all, I would say. So um, we'll talk about that and what Philips is doing to get his arms around that that great big uh, piece. So um, with that, I'll introduce our panel. Uh, first of all, in the middle, actually, uh, Ralph Cardinal. Ralph is the R&D Director of Electronic Medical Equipment at Boston Scientific, where he leads a global R&D team to deliver medical equipment designs, solutions, technology, and systems. Uh, he has over 25 years of experience in the medical device industry across cardiac, urology, and neuromodulation. So thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, on the far end, Rich Nazarian. Uh, co-founded Minitronics in 1996 and currently serves as the company's CEO and chairman of the board. Uh, Rich is the principal inventor on 15 patents, the chief author on numerous papers on medical device development, and leader in the development of new and innovative uh, medical devices like implantable artificial heart electronic systems, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass systems, laser imaging systems, ventricular assist devices, and nerve, nerve growth stimulators. So, thanks Rich. And uh, closest to me here, uh, third but not last, uh, Dr. Roy Smythe, uh, MD, is a global chief medical officer for healthcare informatics at Philips and consultant to a number of growth stage healthcare companies. Um, he's considered an expert in leveraging technologies to change healthcare delivery and writes and speaks frequently on these topics. He's had a couple panels a month. It's kind of your typical pace. Thanks. For, thank you for being here. So, so we're going to again take a, a few questions for the, for the panels here and then questions from the uh, audience. Sound like a plan? 
You should not, because it's all we have lined up for this morning. We'll be staring at each other for an hour. It'll be very awkward. Okay, so that's the plan. And uh, just because uh, Ralph got here first, uh, he's going to go first. So uh, it's your own fault, really. Um, so super broad, broad question first. Um, so no company can do everything internally, you know, even a big, giant global uh, firm like Boston Scientific. So how do you guys decide what you're going to do inside and optimize versus what you're going to do externally or through a partner or a joint venture, or those kind of options? Sure. Got to make sure this is on. It sounds like it's on. Um, well, typically it's a combination. It, it's not a what well, either or type of thing. It's always a combination of doing uh, work inside and then partnering uh, outside on most projects. There's research that we do internally. That uh, can be completely organic. Uh, but eventually during development, uh, these projects are very large, they, very large systems that can be. And uh, partnering with someone on the outside with capabilities that we don't have yet inside or don't want to build internally, that's, that's a very typical approach to determining what we're going to do inside versus outside. It's really looking at that capability that a partner or a vendor brings that we need or, or that we don't want to build. And is it mostly a, a need arises and it's opportunistic and you have to go find a solution or is it sort of planful where you have categories of things you do want to do and don't want to do and it's fairly clear going in? So um, we do a reasonable job at um, identifying the capabilities that we're going to, to build. So if I look, if I think about Boston Scientific on the implantable device side at pacemakers, defibrillators, those are things that we're going to do in, internally. Okay. Those are, um, that, that's a capability that we definitely want to grow and um, hold to ourselves. But something like medical equipment, in the area that I work on, um, that, that definitely is an area that um, certain things we want to hold and build, telemetry systems, et cetera. But others, um, we definitely want to outsource digital electronics, things like that, that uh, software a lot of times will we'll go and look outside the company to get either help or get a capability that we don't have internally. Okay. So in, in a similar vein for, for Roy, so regarding you know, med device connectivity and big data, it's a pretty big complex process. Um, not something most device companies have done a lot. It's also kind of a speed mismatch. <clears throat> I mean, med device companies kind of move at <clears throat> speed of a glacier, and data and telecom kind of go at the, the speed of light. Um, in fact, when we started doing some development work, moving data six, seven years ago, we had to build a lot of infrastructure sort of from scratch. Um, and that's changed a lot. There's a lot more sort of pieces sort of ready to go. Um, so when you think about that chain of generating de device data, getting it out, out of the uh, site of generation into a cloud, into some useful format that's been you know, pre-digested or analyzed, uh, how do you guys decide, how do you decide what you're going to do and, and not do in that big chain? Well, it, it, is, a, it is a big chain. It, um, I don't think my mic's on though. There it is. There it is. Can you hear me now? It is a big. It is a big chain. When you think about, um, you know, collecting data, you know, curating data, storing it, pushing it back in a way that's, you know, can be effectively used. Nice. Anybody hear any of that? It wasn't very. <laughs> it was brilliant. It know, was very insightful. That's all I have to say. Wow. <laughs> the. Uh, Great. Um, so Philips, uh, Philips has an interest in working across the healthcare continuum, you know, from pregnancy to aging in place. And when I think about the, first of all, I'm not an engineer, so th please don't ask me any engineering or manufacturing questions. I'm more of a biologist and a sociologist. That's going to be clear in the way I answer my questions. But um, I think about <clears throat> As you go across that continuum, it's sort of the difference between analog and digital. There's just a debate about is life analog or is life digital. Life is digital. It's either on or off. You know, you're either alive or dead. But the process of living is definitely analog. You know, everything is in between. It's a continuum. It's an infinite spectrum of wellness and sickness and optimal states and suboptimal states. So how do you bridge a continuum of health as one company? It's 
virtually impossible. Um, so within that continuum, we focus on, we, we touch many disease states, but we focus specifically on four, respiratory, cardiology, fertility, pregnancy, and parenting, and, and oncology. And within those spaces, we look to create solutions, you know, combinations of devices, <clears throat> the technology that connects devices to individuals and to clinicians, the informatics behind that to gain insights. And so again, when you look across that spectrum, it's impossible to fill all the gaps. Um, you could, uh, but you would be working for the next thousand years to fill all the gaps. And so what we do, what we're doing in real time is we're looking you know, in those specific four areas across the continuum of, of care, and we're saying, you know, where do we have capabilities and where do we have gaps? And basically, where we have a gap, we work to fill that in, a, in real time. Um, some of it's outsourcing. Uh, so, for example, for many of our medical devices, we're, uh, we, we work with Qualcomm. We're on their two-net uh, network, uh, to, you know, for connectivity. When it comes to uh, IT assets, we work with Hewlett-Packard. Um, and as, what you'll see us doing over the next several years is, again, within these discrete disease states, probably bringing on more partners, and more mergers, more acquisitions to fill the gaps. Um, so for us, it's a relatively organic process of looking across the continuum and just finding where the gaps are. Mm -hmm. and, and how how difficult is it to deal with that speed mismatch where Qualcomm is going at Qualcomm speed and Phillips has to go at large global med-device pace and tempo? I think uh, in the past it would have been difficult for Phillips. I joined about five months ago, so I can't really speak uh, you know, very, uh, in a very sophisticated way about the past. But I think in the past, its heritage as a big box device company would have made it quite difficult. But I think in its current iteration of you know, being a company that's divided itself up into discrete operating areas with lots of research and development as well, um, you know, uh, we, we sort of have subdivided it enough such that each of those areas feels fairly entrepreneurial mm -hmm. and knows that it has to move fast. Okay. I mean, you know, the, the knowledge is what, doubling every 17 months in healthcare, and so if you're not moving fast, then you're, 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 you, finally, uh, you suddenly find yourself not moving at all. Mm -hmm. That's no small trick. So, so, Rich, these guys are currently working in big, sophisticated global uh, organizations, obviously, and you've dealt with the whole spectrum for 20 years. Little startups, you know, global giants, and everything in between. How similar or different is what they're saying? How similar to or different from is what they're saying to the sort of startups or sort of mid-sized operating companies that you've dealt with in the past? Yeah, I, I think that anybody who's doing product development and medical devices has to look at their, their own risk reward uh, equations around what they know and what they uh, or what they think they know and what they may or may not. And uh, I think over the time that Minitronics has been around that uh, there have been some, I would say, major seismic shifts in how medical devices get to market. And uh, when we started, um, outsourcing was more like just consulting. And the notion of doing a project outside for most companies was pretty foreign. Uh, now, it's sort of normal, par for the course, part of the equation, part of the bag of tricks for people who are in big companies. And, and I think there's a much broader spectrum of engagements than there were years ago. So you would see worlds where, okay, well, we're gonna go outside for development and then we're gonna build it ourselves, or we're gonna develop it ourselves and we'll go outside to the contract manufacturer. Now it's this, myriad of combinations of things that are done half inside, half outside. They're half done and taken outside and then brought back inside. So I think that the, the partner companies have to be a lot more nimble in terms of how they interact with whether it's big companies or small companies because you get programs and products in all different stages of development on your doorstep. So I, I think that's been one big change uh, along with the change of sort of the general acceptance that this is the ecosystem and the big guys aren't going to do everything all by themselves. And then I think the other thing that we've seen, um, obviously it's been going on for forever, but um, the big guy, you know, the big fish are, have always eaten the little fish. So there's that acquisition steam that's uh, always existed in medical device companies. 
And so what we'll see is, yeah, we've been dealing with a bunch of small companies and now suddenly they're big companies. And uh, I think most of the big companies, I don't know, I won't speak for these guys, but uh, I think they recognize that that's gotta be a part of what they manage. So when acquisitions are made, obviously they're either uh, you know, bringing all of that capability inside or they're working with new partners that they weren't necessarily working with before. So it's not necessarily an organic genesis of those uh, dynamics and relationships. So I think that's, that's a, a little more re recent phenomenon for us anyway. And, and I just think it goes back to this question of everybody is looking to mitigate their risks and, and that's the biggest difference between little companies and big companies is their risk reward equation is different. Yeah. I think the startup and the small end of the spectrum, the startup world has changed <clears throat> excuse me so much. When I started in the industry, you know, most early startups had, you know, a, a building. They had an actual facility, a little office that they worked out of and there were eight people there and they were all employees. They all worked there and they had a marketing guy and a red guy and and down the down the line. I would say the typical early start that we see today is typically three people, and they usually are in the same state, which is sort of different. So the degree of being able to be virtual you know, pretty early on and continue on through is, is pretty different than it was uh, when I was younger and had hair getting into the industry. <laughs> Very different. Um, so on that uh, topic of risk, I'm going to kind of change order here a little bit. Uh, Roy, so when you outsource part of a function or part of a process or whatever else, I mean, you give up some control. And as device people, we're all pretty, we're control freaks, right? We're verifying and validating and doing DBTs and ECO controls and everybody has to sign things. And, uh, but inherently, when you outsource or partner with somebody, you have to give up some degree of control. How, how does that fly within Phillips of having a, a key part of a process that someone else is going to go do for a while? I think every, uh, every good partnership is built on trust, first of all. So uh, obviously, uh, and I've only, again, I've only been with Phillips for five months, so I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I, what strikes me is that you know, our, our partnerships are built primarily you know, on, the, on the concept of trust. And of course, there's a lot of stuff that comes underneath that, that heading. I think also it's a company that's you know, 125 years old, so we've been doing partnerships and outsourcing and mergers and acquisitions for a long time. Uh, I also think that scale helps uh, big companies to some degree in these relationships. Uh, for example, we have, uh, we have individuals that their only job is to manage these relationships, uh, the big ones. Uh, the uh, Bernard Malamud, I, it's baseball time, so Bernard Malamud wrote the book The Natural. You may have seen the movie with Robert Redford. And he has this quote that sounds sort of uh, self-evident, but he says, you know, when a train gets on the wrong track, every station it stops at is the wrong station. And so we have people that basically they spend their lives managing these relationships, checking in, making sure that the locus of control stays in the middle or where it should be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, that being said, uh, uh, you know, we work not only with device companies and informatics companies and, and as I mentioned earlier, networking and IT outsourcing companies, we also work with health systems in academic institutions like I'm sure Boston Scientific does as well. And in those situations, it, it, I think it is fair to say that we do have an interest in controlling uh, certain parts of relationship versus what they control. Um, in these co-creation relationships, Phillips often, not always, but often uh, would prefer to retain the IP. Uh, and then in exchange for the work with the health system or the academic institution, then obviously give them uh, benefits in other ways like preferred pricing and preferred partnership and preferred contracting and that sort of thing. So again, for us, it starts with trust, uh, you know, but as, uh, you know, <laughs> as might be a, a statement that we should r resurrect for our current times, it's trust, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like uh, things tend to go well really if you have a lot of clarity early on where it's very clear who's doing what, it's very clear who's deciding what. It's very clear who has sign-off and veto authority on what, because trying to sort things out when there's already a problem or an issue has come up is, is a whole lot less fun. So I think the idea of having dedicated resources is, is pretty smart. Um, so 
Ralph, kind of along that, that vein, what's, what's, what are the hardest parts in picking a, the right outsourcing vendor or the right partner? Is the hardest part finding the right partner or is the hardest part getting people internally aligned to figure out what the org actually wants and needs and what su success looks like? So typically it's not finding the, the hard part is not finding the right partner. Um, it's uh, getting agreement on who is the right, right partner for, for a given project. Um, having a strategy, so uh, at Boston Scientific uh, for the medical, for sourcing, global sourcing, and the different areas or verticals as we would say, um, one being electronic medical equipment or source finished medical devices. Uh, we have a strategy of, uh, and that strategy is around uh, several different partners. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, Rich mentioned the big companies eating the small fish, the big fish, small fish. And that's true, we acquire, Boston Scientific acquires lots, of, we're a company of acquisitions for the most part. And um, unfortunately, that, that leaves a lot of different partners that we have to deal with because of the acquisition. We have over 12 contract manufacturers to deal with just in my group, and um, it, it's hard to move them away from that. So a strategy would be, hey, when we, uh, to, to move away or consolidate that, and that is a strategy we have. Um, so that's first and foremost is to have that strategy. The criteria, we have an enormous spreadsheet with um, different criteria that gets filled out subjectively, um, and then we come up with a number. Uh, for each project and each vendor. That's directional, it's not uh, absolute. So criteria is very important. And the, the objectives piece and thinking, of that the objectives is pretty straightforward, but uh, that is, um, the hard part is that criteria. You get a number for each, each vendor and then trying to decide what that means and, and if it's, if it's the, the right one. So uh, getting the group and the organization around and understanding having a strategy and the criteria is very important because that'll help you make that decision in a cleaner way. Do you try to make it objective as, as much as you can? Convert subjectivity yes. into Yeah, the, the, we try to take a motion. We have, we're, we're all about data-driven decision making, okay. so we try uh, that to do our best, um, but there is a subjective in the end, subjectivity. How right. do you score them on trust? <laughs> Trust is not one of them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Quality is, though. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an indication of trustworthiness. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine you know we deal with a lot of big companies, and a lot of them, you know, Medtronic, for example, St. Jude, I'm sure Boston Scientific has some corporate operations functions and corporate functions, but also divisional functions who have say in to their own fates. Um, so how do you balance all those stakeholders? I mean, you've got. I don't know how many divisions Boston Scientific has, it's six or eight or some number like that. Seven. Seven, okay. <laughs> so uh, I work across all the divisions and then also with corporate, and that's a very interesting um, area. Uh, you know, in fact, sometimes people think I'm corporate, but I'm not, and my group is not, not yet. And um, corporate has, the, the, the divisions rule, at least at Boston Scientific, a division can make decisions for the most part, independent or outside of corporate, but uh, corporate definitely helps and has processes and commonality. But in the end, divisions make decisions. That's unfortunate because we end up with more vendors and partners than we probably should, uh, but that, that currently is, is the way. I think it's a good way. Yeah, it's tough to balance. There's no right answer, right? It's either which variety of right and wrong you want to balance. And I would add that you know, we're structured very similarly. You know, we have a three large clusters and within each of those clusters we have a number of business groups and we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we do give those business groups a fair bit of autonomy to make their own decisions about you know, partnerships, you yeah. know, even some outsourcing agreements and mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. So Rich, I mean, doing this for 20 years, you've seen a huge sample size of companies, different sizes, sophistication levels, and so on. Um, where have you two, this is a typical, what are some ways that you've seen OEM companies struggle in picking partners or vendors and so on? I think um, one of the challenges, uh, it is pretty different for smaller companies or startups than it is for, the, for these guys, I think. One of the challenges, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but what we've seen with the bigger guys is that 
over different administrations in large companies, um, who is in sort of has the conch on picking the vendors and uh, interacting with the vendors waxes and wanes. So it can be through supply chain or it can be through development. Um, and so the need, wants and needs of those different organizations are clearly pretty different and their priorities are different. Um, and sometimes you get this decentralized uh, approach that uh, these guys have talked about, which I think probably works great for them. And uh, other companies are more, you know, this is our global sourcing strategy on outsourcing and it applies to all divisions. So um, I think that the sort of the um, transient nature of some of those decisions around what the philosophy of the company is going to be and how they're going to approach their partners has an impact that takes years to kind of work out. With the smaller companies, um, it's, uh, I think, what you described, Jim, where the world of, gee, we're going to hire a bunch of people and we're going to build this up and we're going to do it all ourselves and we're going to grow a medical device company, that world is pretty, is, is I wouldn't say gone, but it's definitely threatened. And um, I think that, uh, that the biggest challenge is in general with, with any partner relationship is around decision making and who are the decision makers and what are the stakeholders and one of the advantages one of the speed advantages of little companies typically potentially is that their decision making they don't have layers of decision making they maybe have two uh, at most um, and uh, I think that's a big a big challenge with the bigger companies some of them will come to us and say well in fact we want to engage you because we think you can go faster than we can we think you, that you can be more nimble uh, just by nature of less bureaucracy. You don't have our horsepower, but you might be able to go faster. And then encumbering that with a decision-making process is sort of self-defeating. So I, I think that that's a struggle. Uh, I understand why it's that way for those companies. I was on the other side of that fence for 11 years at 3M, and, and I understand why it's that way. But I think those are, those are big differences between little companies and big companies. Um, little companies, the, one of the biggest challenges, everything is, everything is urgent and the important is, uh, is falls victim to the urgent. So the immediacy of doing everything to hit the next milestone and meet the next thing that you have to meet can, can create greater risk down the road. So there's, there's this trade-off for sort of short-term reward for uh, increased long-term risk with little companies. So I, I just want to, um, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the change, earlier change in how uh, small companies at least uh, used to be uh, do everything. I have been in both in a startup that did try to do everything themselves and now um, then most recently another startup that did everything virtually. So that that's, uh, rings very, very true now. Yeah, I think one thing we see occasionally is, is a company will come to us for co-development project or, or something and one thing that's very difficult is someone will come to us and they'll, they might say well we have three options we might work with JBuild which is a big multi-billion dollar global manufacturer they make iPhones and things like that they, they do medical stuff too may work with JBuild or maybe you guys Minitronics or my brother-in-law Larry is an engineer and he has a soldering iron and we're pretty sure he could figure this whole thing out <laughs> And for me, that's a gigantic waving red flag where there's such different tools, different solutions, different problems. Uh, we always try to help dig into what, what, are you, what are you actually trying to accomplish and how, because uh, if you're looking at options that are that dissimilar to each other, uh, it's probably worth just making sure your problem statement is really, really tight. Because if you're trying to show if you're gonna use a chainsaw, a hammer, or a toothpick, uh, it's, it's important to figure out what, what, what exactly is the problem you're trying to resolve. So if I could I, give I, one piece of unless, unless advice. I, but I do think sort of capitalizing on what they both said about, uh, you know, about the importance of creative assembly, I do think while, you know, making a discrete problem statement is important and knowing what your goal is is important, I think my time spent as a clinician and a health system administrator uh, tells me that health systems are tired of point solutions. Provider organizations, are, they don't want to deal with 10,000 vendors. And so this concept of either being somewhat comprehensive 
or cobbling together more comprehensive solutions, you know, by creative assembly. Uh, that's what the market wants. It's, I think it's, and I also have worked in a growth stage, a couple of growth stage companies, and have mentored a number. And it is seductive to think that we're going to be the world's expert uh, on measuring this one lab value, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and acting on it, while the provider has a zillion lab values to deal with in each individual patient. And so I think this concept of of making comprehensive solutions available to the market is really important no matter how you get there. Yeah. As device people, we like to think about widgets because that's kind of where most of us came from. And very often the hospital's problem isn't a better widget. They've got a bigger problem, and the widget is just part of the landscape they gotta, yeah. they got to work out. Um, I thought maybe we'd take a few minutes and do some, some audience Q&A. Do you have another microphone, or is this the, uh, the one that we just roam with? So don't be shy. Uh, if you have a question, just stick your hand up. Sir. So uh, we're filming this, so I need to restate the question. So, so the question is, how do we handle IP when you're doing shared services or outsourcing like this? Um, you want to take a crack at it? Sure. Um, it can vary, but, t but typically, uh, Boston Scientific will own the IP, so we'll put into agreements and the contract, contractual agreements that will own IP. There are exceptions, and, and I can think of a good reason why. So in some cases, we um, are willing to p perhaps forego IP in the interest of getting a reduced cost, as an example. So maybe there's some building blocks that a company has that we're very interested in, and they own the IP on those building blocks. Therefore, we would leverage those and not own that IP. Um, but we may put restrictions around uh, competition that could use that. There, there's many, many different ways around that, uh, to do that. IP globally, there's always a fear. Uh, we do a lot of work um, in Asia, <clears throat> and there's a, there's a fear, say, in China that our IP will escape, and that, that's a valid, um, a valid uh, risk and a valid fear, and we put things in place around that. We still do work there, and you can do work in there. You just need to know how to put some safeguards in place. Have, have, do you guys ever acquire, have experience with acquiring companies that had IP entanglements that you weren't fond of? Or does that, does that get resolved in the acquisition process before it ever gets to you, do you think? Um, typically, I'm sure there has been. I can't think of a, a specific example, but typically the the layers get very, very much involved um, before during they, diligence. Yes. Before they write the check. For yes. Our, our IP, again, I, I, I'm probably not the best person to speak to this because I've only been at Philips for about five months, but our, our IP in general, I think, functions much like Boston Scientific. Again, when we, when we start with a de novo co-creation project with an academic or clinical partner, our preference is to retain the IP and reward the partner in other ways. But you know, every one of these engagements is different and they all have different uh, they're all on their own track and different, you know, parts of development life cycle. It just depends. Yeah, I think one uh, key thing to think in mind is, <clears throat> is when we talk about IP, we can actually mean a bunch of different things. I think it's very important to be super clear about the discrete kinds of IP. So, you know, the IP that the customer comes, comes in with, they have to obviously still own that stuff. Sometimes a vendor will have some IP they bring to the table, whether it's process or design or something else. You know, typically if something's developed on the customer's nickel, the customer has to own that. that Typically, it's, there's no other good way to do that. Uh, but there are other things people don't think about enough in terms of just public domain stuff. You know, people sometimes want licenses or ownership of stuff that's public domain, which isn't, doesn't really work. Or you have you know, IP embedded in components in a, in a, in a system, you know, chips and the screen. That stuff has IP embedded in it. Um, people don't think about that a lot. But you should be careful how you do contracts to make sure everyone's super clear on what they own, what they don't own, what they get licensed to, you know, what they can use somewhere else, and so on. So again, I think it goes to you know, good fences make good neighbors. You know, good clear contracts make good arrangements that'll that'll endure. And being super clear about the different pieces of IP and different types is is pretty darn important, I think. That's a great question. Uh, next question, please. Testing, testing. I don't think this. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good.
Good morning, Todd Ellingson with Marsh McLennan Agency. Uh, so I totally agree with the, uh, your comments about the changing startup environment, and you mentioned some of the challenges that that presents, but uh, what are the opportunities um, that that environment might, all, that environment might also uh, present? So the question is what, what uh, opportunities does this ch change new, more virtual startup environment offer? Challenges are kind of obvious, but what are the opportunities? So um, opportunities are you're going to spend a lot less money and you're going to get it uh, closer to what you want and you can leverage those other uh, some some uh, capabilities that you wouldn't you don't are very expensive to build or maybe you can't even build them internally as a startup. So doing a virtual startup is um, is a fantastic way. Typically in the med medical side, you're trying to prove out a therapy rather than a device. Um, and so acquiring a device, changing it incrementally to then leverage and use in your therapy to, to get, prove that out, that's really the goal of a medical startup, medical device startup. I'll just mention one other challenge I think that, that I've noticed in my short time at Phillips and that is, um, you know, it's such a diverse, far-flung, uh, difficult to wrap your hands around or arms around uh, ecosystem of startup companies and growth stage companies due to the funding, the infusion of funding and the digital revolution. And so I think and one of the things that, that we are working avidly on is developing a, a structured process via which we keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on in a number of areas and then have a rapid evaluation um, and assessment process as well. That's more difficult than you would think especially for a company that's got diverse interests. Yeah, I think one more benefit is just the, the expertise you can find and use temporarily nowadays is totally different. I mean, if you think about 20 years ago, if you were an expert in something kind of esoteric like you know, implantable textiles or something like that, you kind of had to network around and find those kind of people. And if you, it took time and it was hard to have a lot of choices. Now with you know, LinkedIn and so on, so you can find someone with some crazy exotic technical expertise that you need on one little thing in an afternoon. You call them up, you can do things like WebEx and go to meeting and file sharing and all this kind of stuff. It's just so much vastly easier to get access to these super experts that, that are exactly what you need, whereas you, you would have probably previously had to just find someone who's sort of close enough and they could figure it out. The, the degree of specificity you can find with expertise is is amazing. And for those guys too, it would be hard to find a, it'd be hard to build a consulting gig 20 years ago with this super niche expertise. Uh, whereas today, if you have some obscure skill set, you can go out and hang on a shingle, have a consulting business, and people can actually find you efficiently, and you can make a business out of that. So uh, the, the layers of how it's different are, are, are pretty amazing, but it's, 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 it's amazing what you can save in terms of, of burn rate and cost, uh, but also just how fast you can find expertise and use it efficiently it's pretty pretty different world I think well, I would say it's it's you can find you can find uh, areas of work fast or areas of specificity but you can't always find the best one very quickly and so that there's sure. still a process involved there yes. the, the company that has the best Facebook page may not be the company that can actually deliver <laughs> a product yeah How, how's our Facebook page it's fantastic <laughs> It's uh, yeah sometimes the, the the smartest people don't have the best LinkedIn uh, profiles in the whole world this is it's a fact. I'd say from our, our purely selfish, self-interested Minitronics perspective, there's, it creates a whole bunch of opportunities. One, I think startups are a lot more open-minded about what they will, what they're open to licensing in, even these notions that they're not going to own every piece of intellectual property that's in their product. I'd say they're more open to that. And um, it's created something of an open playing field in middle market medical device opportunities uh, where, you know, if, you don't, if you're not chasing a five or $10 billion market, it's hard to get venture dollars to, to fund your program. And so those markets are not getting addressed. And I think uh, there are gonna be creative ecosystem solutions to that problem and they're still kind of forming. And I think we have an opportunity to help be part of that solution. Next question, please. You know, you had mentioned earlier that the trust but verify issue, 
What benchmarks are you using for that verification process? What tools? So the question was uh, the whole idea of trusting but verifying. What, uh, what tools do you use to try to, to verify that? I, well, I don't know. I think often it's, well, one of the other things that's changed actually is people have a lot more experience with outsourcing than they used to. So mo all these guys obviously have been through it m many times. And so they built, I don't know, there's nothing like personal networks and connect, having worked with people before to understand how they operate and whether they're, <laughs> here you go back to how do you rate their trustworthiness. Personal experience is, it's hard to beat that. And most of our business still comes through word of mouth. So I, I don't know if that speaks to your question or not, but I think that's a big factor. Yeah, my, my perspective, someone once told me trust but verify is not trust at all. So, um, <laughs> because you have to verify. But uh, definitely um, networking and, and knowing a person uh, or several people or a company and having experience with a company, that is um, one of the biggest things because then you can start quantifying, hopefully, uh, some of that different criteria. Trust is still not one of them, but um, there are many, many other areas that would tend to build up what you could call a, a trust in a company. Yeah, I think reputations are real. I mean, we all kind of build reputations over the course of years and years, and if I develop a bad one for myself, it's probably a good kernel of truth in there. If I develop a decent reputation for myself, uh, it's probably somewhat earned. And uh, I think companies are the same way. If you ask around through your network, you'll, you'll learn about individuals and companies and what they're good at, what they're not good at, uh, to a pretty surprisingly accurate, accurate degree. A lot of times you hear about somebody or a company, you actually work with them, and usually your experience ends up kind of matching what you heard about in advance, so for, for good or bad. <clears throat> hey, just, um, just, to, just to elaborate, I, as I, don't, I don't think either of my colleagues are happy with my trust comment. So I was a, uh, I was a surgeon for a long time, and so the con concept of trust for me is that, you know, uh, you have to build your trust every, every case. So uh, it's almost like you're starting over every time you go to the operating room, unfortunately. You can't bank trust. Uh, and so if that's what you mean, I agree. Um, and again, for us, I, you know, I don't know what tools we use, but I do know that we deploy a fair number of resources that are focused specifically on managing these relationships. And again, I think that's one of the benefits of scale. And uh, we've all seen you know, partner, partnering opportunities or, or, or joint ventures, whatever, you know, go well and go poorly. Um, if, if you have examples in your mind of things that didn't go great, but had a, had a, a, a good learning experience you'd take away to, to, to avoid that issue again. If you have examples in your head, specific or general, how many do you want? <laughs> <laughs> you got a few, I suppose. Yeah, I'm always interested in what, where other people went wrong or where we went wrong as being learning exercises. You learn a lot more, don't you? Well, uh, yeah. So I, I think I think misalignment of expectations is the is is, is a big one, and um, and it's just hard. I, I, I do love that comment about uh, if you're on the wrong track, all the stations are wrong. That's kind of getting off on the wrong foot is, is difficult and it's hard to repair that. So uh, we certainly have stubbed our toes in plenty of places. And I think a lot of that goes to, it comes down to individuals and who, who's making the connections and are they making the right connections and are they really talking about the right things at the right time. And, and that progression ends up building the trust. Uh, otherwise, it's really hard to restore that if, um, you know, if we're going in one direction and our partner customer is going in another direction or they had very different expectations, it's hard, it's hard to put that back together again. And it, could, it can feel like, well, they don't seem like uh, a trustworthy partner when I don't think anybody, it, we've rarely ever had an experience where we thought somebody acted in an inappropriate or unethical way as a partner or a customer. It's just they had, we have misaligned priorities and we, and, and we might not have put together the team that could do what needed to be done. And so I think being sort of honestly self-reflective about that is, is a really important way to build trust. You know, if you've got an issue to, 
get together with a, a partner and say, you know, we probably don't have the strength or resources or capability in this area that we'd hoped for, or, we need, or, that, it, or that it turns out we need more of this than we thought we did. Um, I think that, that kind of thing is, is really critical to, to making these things work. Yeah, I would say the vast majority of projects I've ever been involved with have some degree of scope change at the first real sit-down meeting where you're actually building a timeline. Uh, you talk for a few weeks, proposals in place, everyone's putting stuff on paper, it seems super clear, and you actually start thinking it through, and it's almost always something that someone just forgot to think about. Or you had, you're using the same words, everyone's nodding their heads, but you mean two subtly different things, and that light bulb comes on, and you have to, to align those things. So I think being super clear going in, getting things on paper, checking to make sure that everybody meant what you think it meant is hugely important. And as you go along, things change, right? You hit bumps in the road. Things are easier than you expected. Things are harder. Things take longer or shorter. It's just nature of development, especially. Um, and uh, clear, adjusting expectations uh, as you go is super important because if you diverge for too long, it's a lot of heart, it can be a lot of heartache and expense to get things back on track for either party, both, whatever. No one has a good time with when those things happen. No one's happy. So, so one, I can think of a couple examples, but one common theme in those couple uh, of projects that one got canceled in the end and the other um, cost probably two to three times more than it was originally thought and the last uh, schedule was at least twice is um, the, the R&D team uh, outsourced most of the project and then really didn't, they kind of threw it over the wall, yeah. so to speak. And, and there weren't enough resources, both systems engineers and otherwise, otherwise to go along with the project. They expected the, the uh, partner, the vendor, to do too much uh, without enough help from Boston Scientific or, or the company we acquired in one that case. That wasn't with us, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Always no. And uh, in both cases, it was with offshore firms, which yeah. makes it even harder. And, and so that, that's, um, we, we do plenty of offshoring, but you have to go through the, as I would say, two years of the valley of despair with one of these <laughs> companies and then get to the other side and, and things are better, but you get, it, it is not an easy task. How much harder is it, how much harder is going offshore for complex things than st staying in the U.S.? Twice as hard, 20% harder, eight times as hard, kind of what's the magnitude? It, it depends, so again, um, if you've gone through that, that valley of despair, so to speak, <laughs> uh, things, things start working out fairly well because you understand what they can and cannot do and, and what, um, and, and how to build their capability to help you. So that it's, it's not twice as hard. Um, and, and sometimes they have a capability that, that you don't have and, and, and can leverage. I'd say it, after you've gone through that process, it's probably, because of the time difference alone, it's probably 20% harder. And you have to account for that. Yeah. It's funny, I thought you said Valium of despair. So that was really funny. <laughs> oh. so I'm, Valley, I'm, but I'm if you want back. Valium, you go ahead. Valium of despair. So. Um, we're getting a little bit low on timers, so we don't run into the next section, but if you had sort of one last piece of advice or words of wisdom or don't do what I did, any of those kind of uh, uh, concepts, please toss them out. Yeah, one of the great benefits of having only been with a company for five months is that, as far as I'm concerned, Phillips has never had a problem with any of this. Outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think... Uh, Again, from my, from my short-term perspective, um, it, we, we work very hard to determine you know, what, what, are, what are the exact capabilities that we need to create the solutions that you know, the providers really want, these more comprehensive solutions. That's where we start. Uh, and then, again, we throw a fair number of resources behind managing the relationships so that we start off on the right track and we don't end up at the, at the wrong station. So I, virtual companies are, are here to stay, both large and now small. And um, I think global is as well. And so as, as I mentioned, it is harder to do the global thing, but um, I don't see that, that stopping uh, for many different reasons. And so both virtual and then virtual global, 
uh, and outsourcing in large and small companies, that, that is where we are and I believe that's here to stay. So I'm an engineer and we think very much like engineers and uh, we like to do things by way of equation, but I'm gonna give a very different answer than that. And I think um, we look at what we maybe don't spend enough time on is looking at the personalities of teams and what's the personality and the culture of the, of the partner organizations in a, in a relationship. And uh, so you can't have all alphas on your team and you can't have uh, you, you have to examine the dynamics of, you know, what are people's, what do people's Myers-Briggs or companies' Myers-Briggs profiles look like, and you have to make, you have to do matchmaking, and it's pretty inexact. But uh, when when we look back or do retrospectives on programs that didn't go well, often it's uh, it has much more to do with the, it sounds very nebulous, the personalities of the players involved and uh, them not being able to communicate effectively. So that's kind of a psychological answer to an engineering problem. I think it's true. I, I would say that uh, really, as clear as you can possibly be with your objectives and your intent. So if you know your partner understands your intent, that will help them filter out noise and go where you actually want them to go. And I think to uh, staying very close to your partner, whether it's you know, on the customer side or the, or the vendor side is critical and communi over communicating, you, you can't over communicate, it's impossible. If you send an update email every single day and talk to them twice a day, and everyone's going on at all times, the big picture and small picture, you, can, you, you will tend to stay on track to a vastly higher degree. So that's my two cents. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys for your time, and thanks everybody for coming and listening to us talk, so thank you.